explosive um, uh, uh, utilization of these forms of movement uh, from, you know, in the course of, of um, is it 10 years, uh, of eight years, uh, going from 321,000 uses up to 80, 84 million trips on these different types of modes. So there's, if, you, uh, if you've been to New York or uh, any of these other large cities or Paris, New York and Paris were cities notorious for being run down if you were a pedestrian. It's completely shifted. It's, it's a, they're completely different cities now. You, you can go as a pedestrian and feel very safe. You can cycle in New York and in Paris. In fact, they're, they, they were so successful that they're, they, uh, there's been a, um, an acceleration of the closures uh, and the movement of the pushing of cars out. Because not only has it been successful in terms of getting people out of cars and moving about in different ways, the economic boom that has resulted has been extraordinary. Uh, because you have more people on foot, more people shopping in the stores uh, because they're, they're not passing it by at 50 kilometers an hour, they're walking by it. So they'll stop and, 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 and look. And of course, it's been a huge uh, boon for, for tourism as well. Um, okay, I talked about this notion of creative spacing and placemaking. There's many ways in which we're finding new ways, new public spaces or ways to expand the public realm. Um, and uh, I'm going to move through this really quickly. I've only got one example of each, I think. We, when we talk about renewed space, think about Queen Street here and what, we've, uh, what was done to Queen Street. A really great example of streetscaping. They took what would have been typical of everywhere else, which is just asphalt, from building face to face, place, small, narrow sidewalk, but they re, re streetscaped, they re, re, uh, reimagined it and renewed it in such a way that you now have parking that uh, cars uh, basically mount onto paved area, which is the parking spot, but when the cars aren't there, it doesn't look like paved area or empty asphalt. It looks like the expanded, it just looks like the sidewalk. And so this, this, is, this is a really clever thing that all cities, a lot of cities are now doing. Asphalt is ugly. The paving, the expanding the pedestrian realm when cars aren't there is what we want to do. It's more aesthetically pleasing, um, and it, it, uh, it, it also is a psychological uh, illusion because if it's asphalt, as a pedestrian, you just stay away from it. But if it's pavers, you feel more comfortable walking on it. It's, it's a psychological uh, impact that we're making because we want pedestrians to use that space. It's their space. The cars that pull up and park every once in a while, they're being invited into our space. That's the, the way we need to think about it because the street, uh, that's that kind of gray zone. Most of the times, cars aren't there. If you actually look at the time, 24-hour uh, time period, most of the time, it's, it's, just, it's actually uh, the pedestrian realm, and pedestrians should be free, free to move through that space. So why do we give it up to the asphalt so it sits dead and empty for much of the day and uh, in the evening? And it doesn't do much for aesthetics either. So that's renewed space. Then we have what we call shared, shared streets, or shared space. Uh, there's a whole new, new, new typology of streets where cars, cyclists, micro, all the micro kind of mobility, and people are sharing the same space. This is not a new idea. This is, in fact, the way we used to, streets used to be used at the time when there was the emergence or movement from horse and carriage into automobile. At that period of time, for a decade or two, all, everybody used the space. You, you should see some of these black and white uh, uh, films uh, of, of, of the street scenes. It's amazing. People are moving about in not just one direction, in all directions. And nobody's hitting, nobody's hitting anybody because, uh, because everyone is paying attention. Because if you're just on a sidewalk and your expectation is nothing but you and a pedestrian is going to be on that sidewalk, you're not paying attention. You're really just thinking, not thinking very much about it. But when people are using the street, including drivers, where there's a shared space, fatalities and, and, and collisions drop completely down. There's no, on these streets, they're the actually safest streets to be on because everybody's in hypersensitive, hypersensitive to everything around them. They're paying, they're paying attention as drivers and uh, as pedestrians. So, Everyone is avoiding each other. <clears throat> um, occupying parking spaces in the summer months with what we call parkettes. This is occupied space. So sometimes these are, they always start off as temporary, but they're so successful that they become permanent. So basically, you take up a parking space, it becomes a place to seat, maybe an extension of the sidewalk, a, a park, a public art thing. Um, and they, they, over the years, they've now become permanent. Um, uh, then we have something called flexible spaces. So Quebec City. In the winter months, less need for sidewalk, no patios. Those bollards move entirely one lane over. So that becomes a travel lane. So in the winter months, they utilize two travel lanes because they need that traffic. In the summer months, uh, there's, uh, they, they push the bollards back out 
and there's this different paving to that laneway, and it becomes a, uh, a, an extension of the sidewalk. So there's really clever ways that we can expand uh, the space and use it better. Um, found spaces. The, the high line I used as a really obvious example, it's a, 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 an elevated rail line that runs through uh, uh, the, um, the, the west side of New York, uh, lower, lower, lower New York, and in, around this area called uh, the um, uh, meet the meatpacking district and up into Chelsea. Uh, and uh, it was just grassed over. Rail lines hadn't been used forever. They were about to, demol they were going to demolish it. And then there's, out of nowhere, this group came out to save the, save the elevated highway. They wanted to think, rethink it. And they sent out a big competition, design competition. And now it's one of the most popular, not only one of the most popular destinations in New York, it's become a huge, uh, it caused a huge uplift in land value and development. It's, it's actually spurred an entire neighborhood uh, all around it because it's become that popular. And this is the best image of the Highline. The Highline is actually a diverse path of different, uh, uh, different things. As it, as it uh, passes through different parts of that part of New York, you, you, Manhattan, uh, there's now buildings that, uh, that uh, new buildings that actually have their main entrances that land right on this elevated area. So it's this kind of layering. You know, in places that are very dense, you kind of, it's conceivable that you might have different levels of, uh, of uh, public realms at different levels in elevation. So going green, this is, um, um, this is, this should be self-explanatory. You know, how do we deal with climate change and flooding issues and, and, uh, and, 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 and the shifts in technology? Green roofs, obviously, uh, the whole movement around green infrastructure, there should be no reason when you have trees on our streets to divert rainwater into culverts. We should be diverting rainwater to our, to irrigate our trees. I mean, it's crazy that, that for years, no one, it's nobody, it never occurred to anybody. Uh, so now, you know, of course, there's, those, uh, those well-resourced, better, better uh, uh, enlightened uh, municipalities are, are completely changing their standards. When they build a new street or new curb, they're ensuring that there's uh, some opportunity for, for rain uh, to be collected and, and to irrigate, uh, which often needs irrigation, uh, our, our planters along the, the boulevards of our, of our streets. Uh, so when we talk about green infrastructure, we're talking about a different way in which we would traditionally do infrastructure so that it's actually, uh, it actually utilizes uh, rainwater uh, and, uh, and other events to, to, uh, to, um, to irrigate, but also to lessen the uh, degree of, of flooding in terms of catching all that water and, uh, and diverting it all to the culverts and all down into the rivers. Uh, naturally, uh, without concrete and asphalt, the rainwater dissipates evenly across the, the landscape. So we, we are trying to emulate that in many ways in our cities now. Uh, adaptive reuse. Any uh, older buildings, especially the robustly constructed ones, uh, this is a brick a brickworks and in, in, in a, in a, in a flood-prone prone valley, but nevertheless, it's been adapted, readapted for offices and for event spaces. It, there's many buildings in, in the 500 lot area that have been uh, that have been uh, that were historically something else that have been readapted. Uh, flood flood control issues and uh, uh, re this is one of the largest flood control um, uh, um, uh, uh, transformations and earthworks in the world right now. It's, it's occurring in Toronto and, and the Don River, which always floods and there's a significant issue because it floods the downtown. Because the mouth of the Don, uh, they thought it was clever to, to, to make it turn at a right angle. Of course, they have to dredge it every year and, you know, and it, it's prone to flooding. So they've now created entirely, um, uh, an entirely naturalized uh, condition, a, a, a meandering new mouth to the Don. So it, with, uh, with uh, significant lands on either side that will help uh, to alleviate and, and, and handle any flood, uh, the 100 year flood issues. It's, and they're creating an island in doing so because it's, it's actually currently Portland is their uh, it's landfill. Um, but another part about getting green is also in terms of buying local. You know, here it's amazing. Uh, you, uh, I've never been to any jurisdiction that is as. Uh, Diligent about keeping to the no bag policy as here, uh, like there's there, you know there's leak I'll call them leakages in other cities. You know they'll you still get a bag if you really want one. You just have to pay for it or you know. But here it's absolutely no bag, and I got used to it after two days. 
no big deal. It's, it's, we just we can change our behavior and adapt to these things. And, and I, I think it's very promising that in a context like this uh, that, that uh, people have embraced that idea without question. And, um, uh, you know, uh, if you think about agriculture in this area and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, there are places like Prince Edward County and, and, uh, and um, uh, Bogo Island and other places in maybe the East Coast that are, <coughs> that have built a, an image or a uh, kind of brand or a uh, kind of um, a cachet about themselves by creating this hype around uh, about architecture or landscape or uh, I think there's a real potential here for uh, for Charlottetown to really build on its strength and I think it's ties to, to food and uh, and the, 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 the island and, and the food that and agriculture that can be produced here we have rich soil and uh, why wouldn't you have uh, the opportunity to create a, um, uh, a really uh, a, a, a place where only uh, you know, completely self-reliant. So your food is very expensive here. Everything's getting shipped in. Maybe there's a way in which you become more self-reliant in, in that respect. And I talk about that as a big idea later. Going green and uh, going smart. A t a ton the, 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 the internet and the, uh, the, the, da the data collection and the, 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 the internet of, of everything. Uh, we, autonomous vehicles, all that stuff, everything is going to be linked, if, if there, everything's already linked, but the, the streetscape is going to change. Our streetscapes are going to have uh, sensors and, uh, and uh, ways in which everything is linked and connected and knows where everything else is. And uh, it, it, it's in large part already there, it's just now making those connections. And uh, it, what it means uh, for, for cities is, is, uh, is, is extraordinary. Um, and uh, it, hopefully it means not only do we have safer streets, but we would also have uh, a better handle on a day-to-day -day basis of the real, uh, the real impact, uh, the real, the, the real, the, the kind of truth of the matter. Just how much parking do we really need? How much, how fast are cars actually traveling? So all that information, rather than having to do a study about it, it's always going to be uh, sort of uh, on-demand on information that, if we need it. Um, so all of this leads into the 21st century. Um, I'm just going to sum it up in terms of the 21st century, uh, uh, some principles uh, to think of moving forward. Uh, again, very simple ideas. Uh, but the aspirations uh, were in terms of, if you were to put a thumb on the, the pulse of where things are moving and how things are going and, and to try to capture it in, in a succinct way, you know, the, the aspirations in terms of cities that we're moving towards is, you know, I talked about a lot about this, the social of walkability, human-scaled places. This is what the millennials really want. Um, uh, authenticity and contextually fitting uh, things. Um, we are intensifying, we're becoming uh, um, adventure places, and this is good. But uh, how, it, how it happens is very important to get right. You know, how do we do it in such a way that you're not detracting or undermining these places? Uh, how do we fit into, into these places? And how do we positively contribute to these places? Um, every single decision, every single change should be about moving and getting things better. It should never be about uh, the, uh, in the 21st century. Why in the world, with everything that we know and all of the resources and wealth that we have as a, as a society, uh, everything that we add should be about be getting things to a better place? Um, flexibility, uh, this is a very important idea. What we know is that everything's changing rapidly, all the time. So we want to try and build, particularly when we're building public investments in public infrastructure, we need to make sure that they're adaptable easily, if, 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 that we're not wasting our money and our time and our effort, that these things are as much, uh, that they're adaptable and multi-purpose as possible. Um, this notion of diversity and complexity is another common theme. Uh, housing, mixed use, uh, this notion of uh, the city as an ecology, uh, that the more diversity is, the healthier it is. Uh, and the more resilient it is as well, because um, you know, if you put all your eggs in one basket and you have another pandemic or another, other, other kind of disruption, you really put yourself at great risk. Um, you know, if, if the city is putting all its eggs in the basket in terms of the, the tourists you get from the ships and liners, which are one of the most unsustainable forms of, of uh, transportation and, uh, and tourism, I don't know that they're gonna last very long, uh, because there's, uh, culturally, uh, there's a, it just seems to be they're heading for, uh, for the head on against the kind of wave of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of consciousness, I guess I'll call it. 
Uh, they pollute, they, 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 they uh, ex exude an extraordinary amount of CO2s. Now, unless they, come, of course, come up with ways in which they become less polluting uh, uh, very quickly, I, don't, I just don't know that's going to happen. But anyway, in the meantime, uh, milk it while you can, right? So uh, green, uh, this notion of green, resilient and ecology. Uh, so you know, this, this kind of captures what the city of the future, the kind of qualities of the city of the future. And um, in terms of getting there, the new urban design agenda, the first principle is what, we, what we've forgotten and we're, we're, trying to, we're getting back to it, is the notion that everything in terms of measure, the measure of the street width, the measure of the building, the measure of, of uh, experience, it's done from the perspective of the human being. It can't be done from the car, it can't be done from the ship and the liner. It needs to get back to basics. And getting back to basics is about our measurement, our heights, our perspective, what do we experience, what is our emotional, our emotional response to places. Um, those are the places that work, ultimately. If we want to get back to, where, where is it that we constantly go back to? Where are the places that we go full circle and start replicating again because they work the best. It's always the ones that are based on our, our, our measurements, our experience, our, 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 our desires, our capabilities, our, our ability to walk, our speed that we move. All of that, anything that's designed to that is more articulate, it's more rich, it's better scaled, it's, it's, uh, it's not going to be windswept and shadowed. It's going to be something that is about our, uh, what's going to enrich our lives and our experience. It's a, it's a very simple concept, but we, we kind of lost touch with it. So uh, getting back to basics uh, of city building and places that we live, it's about humans. Uh, we are, you know, you know, when I say that, I want to be careful not to say that, we, uh, uh, that we're somehow more entitled than every other creature on Earth. What I meant is that if when we're building our places where we live, we should be thinking about who's living and occupying these places with us. But we still have to live and coexist with the rest of nature you know, in this, on this Earth. Or we're, Destined for, if we're not already, uh, destined for, uh, for de decimation. Um, so, you know, the Earth, uh, climate change isn't about killing the Earth. It's about killing us. You understand that, right? Because <laughs> the Earth will long outlive us. It was here long before we came along, and it will be here long after we, we're gone. Uh, so it's, it's about our generation, you know, our children and our children's children. Do we want them to continue to inhabit this Earth? And we have to take care of it. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the second one is the idea of the public realm. I talked about this. It's, it's, a, it's an essential and vital resource, and it belongs to everybody. And that, keeping that frame of mind in terms of design of city building and opportunities and, uh, and exploration is, is, about, is about this notion of the public realm. The third is authenticity and character-driven placemaking that we, we you know, it, it, any attempts to you know, go to Dubai, culture, any, this notion of you know, um, uh, 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 replicating other cultures or trying to, be, trying to be something else that you're not, or mimicking, or, it's just not going to cut it. They don't, they, it never really sustains, it's never sustained life, lifestyle centers. At the end of the day, people are going to know you're just a big box. It's uh, in, in, you know, uh, lip, lipstick on a pig kind of idea. Uh, you know, um, if you're building temper, if you're building for a city that is only ten years or five years old, or, or, or for a five-year purpose, we're often building cities for hundreds of years. And so we have to think more carefully about what we're putting on the ground and what we're building. It needs to be, it needs to have meaning to the people who live there. It needs to add and contribute to uh, not just this generation but future generations. And, and you know, when we make a mistake, it's going to be there for a long time. We need to be careful about those mistakes. Buildings are, are very, uh, very uh, uh, they're permanent structures, and, they're, and they, they have permanence that are beyond our lives. So, uh, important point to make. Um, this notion about complexity, you know, we like things simple. Suburban uh, design of cities, you know, and, and that idea we were modernizing. We were going to separate uses. We were going to separate housing types. It was going to be good and clean and sanitary. <laughs> Uh, we were creating streets that were funnel arterials and nicely organized between local and collective. We were going to create secluded neighborhoods. It was all good. It was going to be paradise, right? That, that was the idea behind uh, the modern planning movement. We realized that this doesn't, it, it actually, it's not creating real places. It's not creating happiness. It's creating no choices. It's giving people less choices. It, it's, it's kind of dumbing down the, the environment to such, a, to such a point that it's, um, that you can be, 
blindfolded and land in, some, in suburban Austin, and it will look exactly like suburban Wawa. It's not different. It's the same places. It's the same, uh, same uh, cookie cutter approach to, to building. Uh, but we need to embrace complexity, diversity, and it will, the city will find its own heartbeat and its own magic, and it will become its own place because of the, the synergies of the people who live there and the mix of people who live there who, who are colliding together all the time. That the humans are social animal, and we, uh, uh, the most cosmopolitan and most amazing civilizations have always grown around dense places where people are colliding. You may not like cities, but ideas, synergies, uh, new foods, new uh, artistic uh, expressions, they come from our interaction with one another. And if we're secluded um, and we're not interacting, some people prefer that, and that's fine. There's a place for everybody, but that is not going to progress our, our, our tolerance of one another, our, uh, our, our uh, democracies, our governance, all of those things require this constant evolution of thought. Uh, suburbanization has really led to a dumbing down, and I really believe that uh, what we're seeing in the U.S., for example, with the populist rise and the, uh, in the, uh, in the, what seems crazy uh, every time I look down at our, our neighbor down south in the of the, everything from uh, the the massacres, uh, the gun violence, the, uh, the ridiculous politics, uh, it's, it's, it's large part, it's accepted because the population is just not smart enough. Sometimes they think to maybe see what's going on around them. Uh, and I think it has to do with seclusion. Um, you know, they've, 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 the sprawl has taken over the U.S. to such a degree that it, uh, there is not, uh, people aren't talking to one another. They're able to choose the communities that they want to engage with, and of course, social media and uh, the echo chambers don't help either. And so it's just, uh, we're seeing a decline of the empire there in a big way. Um, so that's the, uh, uh, um, that's the solution of complexity, and we have to embrace it. And lastly, uh, the nurturing of culture and sensibility for urban design, you know, the process that you're about to engage with in the, in the, uh, in the official plan is a real opportunity uh, to, uh, to the, define the city, that, the kind of city that you want here and what kind of city you believe you are. And, uh, and uh, a big part of this, the, the urban design agenda is really in, uh, in, in building a million urban designers. That this is, it's not a, it's not a, there isn't a profession called urban design. It's a practice and, um, and uh, there can be many urban designers. And uh, um, at the end of the day, uh, inclusion and the process ensures that the plan gets implemented because everybody becomes a steward of that plan. Uh, they become, they take ownership over it. So the big ideas for Shaw Town, let me do these very quickly. Uh, um, the objective to, I'm trying to, you know, this was just for fun, kind of whimsical. Uh, the key objectives as I see it from what I know about Charlotte Town, and of course it, uh, I, 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 I'm, uh, Trying to be humble about this because I don't, I don't know as much as you. I haven't been part of the background study, but just I've been here many times before. There has been a gap of, of uh, almost 10 years since I've last been here. Uh, but uh, based on this input of what's going on in trends in, in the world, and and what I see on the ground here, um, I think my, my, from my perspective, the real key objectives for your vision need to be around sustainable growth and how you stop sprawling, because you are still sprawling, uh, and how you foster civic pride and stewardship. Uh, I think the city's getting away with a lot in terms of quality of the environment here. I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, it, you don't have to go far to see how it could be done better. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's, and I don't like this idea that you don't deserve better. It just doesn't make sense to me that, that you would, um, you would uh, hold back from uh, investing in your own city because you're, you're a small city or because you're in PEI. Or, I, mean, I think that's, I think it's a, that's a cop out. Um, uh, ensuring housing for all, there's a big problem, like a lot of cities that are facing affordability issues in the housing crisis. You need to nurture a culture of walking. We gotta figure it out. Somehow, to, it needs to be inviting. You need to want to choose to walk. You, can't be, you shouldn't be forced to, of course. But there has to be a way in which walking becomes a real pleasurable part of your culture here. Uh, and, that, uh, and I think there's going to be a little bit of, a lot of carrots and maybe a few little sticks to help out. Uh, but that's the way you do it. That's the way other cities have done it. And I, this notion of radical self-reliance, which I was talking about, look, what, what if PEI, you're an island and you really, you know, really 
took that as a as a as a as a call to to uh, to um, uh, not become isolation uh, isolate uh, like an isolate isolated place, but a place that really embraces what are our, our, our sustainable ideas about local buying local, growing local, eating local, um, and, and it becomes this real mantra that uh, takes hold here. And the restaurants and this notion of vertical agriculture takes hold. And um, you know, what if, what if it becomes something that, that becomes part of your economic, um, economic growth and, and diversity? So the first big idea is, is a sustainable urban structure of complete communities. And I talked about what complete communities are, but if you drew a five minute walk around all of the different neighborhoods, it's interesting that you almost land in the big, 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 the bigger grid that defines uh, Charlottetown. And you have, uh, a, a, you have multiple centers, potentially, not just the downtown, but you can begin to focus mixed use and office development and other types of places. Eventually, where that big box, that big uh, lifestyle center, big box stuff, with that mishmash of, of uh, big sprawl uh, shopping commercial area, that's your potential for another mixed use, I don't call it downtown, but a center that helps to maybe alleviate the pressure off, off the downtown uh, and also helps to serve the, 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 uh, the communities around it. But there's other sub, sub centers as well, at major intersections. And then linking it all together is your, uh, your potential for your urban corridor. Low to mid rise, not very, uh, you know, like we're talking six stories, depending on how wide the street is. The width of the street should determine how big your buildings are. And, um, and that becomes uh, critical mass you need for, to support storefronts and, and other types of things. That then means that it becomes far easier to reach to those neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods, right now, for the most part, to get to the commercial areas, they still have to get in the car and drive. So, how do you define your city, reinforce a structure that is more human scaled? And that allows everyone in every neighborhood within five minutes, and sometimes 10, to be able to actually access the services and stores and all that stuff within five minutes. This is a long-term vision. This is going to take generations. But it's, it's, you, this is the time to get that in blueprint and start working towards it so that you don't put impediments to it happening. And so what that can potentially become, and I also, uh, there's employment areas, of course, and there's major institutions that are also draws and destinations. Um, and so, what if that, in the future, becomes the, uh, infer the, the critical mass to support not just the bus that happens every half hour, but really true viable transit. It's a rapid transit that should happen every five minutes, every five to ten minutes. And the city has to commit to it, to actually make it work, because uh, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be a for sure thing, it needs to be direct and, uh, and get you to where you need to get to. So, um, downtown, obviously, uh, the key corridors, the, the mid-rise corridors, and then, and why not a ferry link eventually? That you might, so if you're living, and I know a lot of people live in Stratford, and they have to drive to get into downtown, but give them an option of not driving, uh, uh, whether it starts off as a water taxi, I don't know, do you have water taxis here? Okay, so even just a water taxi, um, you know, that takes two, three cars off the road um, and uh, gets people to walk if they work in the downtown. But eventually, that also might even link outer parts of the, of, the, of the Charlotte town. So you might be able to link into some of the edges, which currently aren't served by transit. So, and they, might, they may never have the critical mass or density to support transit, but they might uh, support a, uh, a ferry, a small ferry, or some kind of taxi that would get people downtown. Just trying to think about ways in which to get people out of their cars, because transit is about beginning and ending your on foot. There's always a pedestrian in transit. So you run in a bus or on a ferry or on a train, but you will always be walking as well. And you'll walk uh, you know, uh, a significant amount as well. And so uh, it, gets you, it gets you to walk about. Now, there's another layer here, and I'm not getting into the details of it, but what we call the, the last mile, which is the conundrum is, okay, once you get off the station, how far do you have to go? And how do we break that distance down? So that you have to get, if you get your house is, you know, just a little bit beyond the, after a long day's work and, you know, it's about a 10 minute walk, I'd rather just drive because I can, can, it's easy to. But, uh, so the conundrum is how do we get people to the station, from the station to where they want to get to? There's bike share, there's uh, this whole micro mobility thing, and, and you know, I, I have a bike share membership 
uh, in Toronto, I, whenever I go to New York or other major cities, Paris, I always use the bike share there. Uh, it's a really easy way to get about, far better than the car. Um, but um, maybe it's a shuttle, and maybe with autonomous, we're looking at 20, 40 years down the road, the first thing that we're going to see that's autonomous is not autonomous vehicles, private vehicles. We're going to actually see autonomous shared vehicles first, like little shuttles and buses that are driverless. Maybe that's, there's, there's little, uh, from each of these major stations, which is, you know, this might begin as a busway, eventually maybe as a tram, <coughs> unlike, unlikely as, as a subway, because you won't have the densities to support it. But um, maybe from each of these stations, there's a, an autonomous vehicle that just goes uh, in a perpendicular, perpendicular direction, in a, this constant circle. You hop on, you, you go a little bit further, you reach and you hop off again. So uh, transit's going to change a lot, and there's no reason why uh, you can have a more viable transit system. Um, I didn't go into a lot of detail, but the idea of an international caliber capital district, capital and culture district, this becomes a real hub um, uh, of, uh, of not just historic buildings, but it's a, it's a functioning capital district with, uh, with, um, uh, with a lot of cultural amenities and, 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 and concentrations of culture that happen. That's what it, that's what it is now, but to kind of more, form, more, more formalize it. I, I, no, I don't see capital being used a lot in Charlottetown uh, in the same way that other cities use it. So maybe it's a real opportunity to, to embrace and celebrate that you're a capital city. I mean, it's, it's not only a historically significant one, but anyway, I, don't, I just thought that as a, as a, as a, as a uh, just as a branding, it's, a, it's an important idea. Okay, time for complete and beautiful streets. So I talked about Queen Street and the success of Queen Street, and I just quickly some I images that I took. <laughs> you have cyclists, you have people in wheelchairs um, who are, who, it's like an obstacle course, and, um, yeah. and, and, it's, and they're taking their lives into their own hands with, uh, with the cars who, who, uh, who, who, who don't always know that they're there, and uh, they don't, they're not dedicated laneways, although there's plenty of room for cars, dedicated lanes, and, and ramps for, for, for wheelchairs. They're, they're, it's not like there's, it's not like you got to press for space here. You have the space. Um, this is really great. May, but cyclists may use, the, um, may use the full lane, as if. Um, I don't know, I mean, I'm, a cycl I'm an avid cyclist and I'm a pretty adventurous person, but I, I don't think that that is a well-known, the good thing about this place is culturally, and uh, God hope that we, we'll keep this for a long time because, uh, because it, was, it was the case in Vancouver and I remember Boston, as soon as you put your foot on the roadway, all the cars will stop. There's a recognition and acknowledgement of pedestrians and there's a respect for them. Um, you know, versus Montreal, which <laughs> it's uh, speed up. You know, everybody knows that story. They all speed up to you. But now Montreal is one of the most advanced places or cities for bike lanes. You know, it's, they've done a really good job of, of, of turning around that image. But it's it's just I don't. It's not that I don't trust people. I just I think I think it's just too it's just too risky. Especially if I'm going to have, especially because because all you have is that small little sign and that tiny you know, that painted faded painted. But I just don't think there's enough presence visually to remind drivers of the fact that this is a shared space. And, 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 and you'll get honked at if you're, if, uh, if you're, um, if you're out of order, right? Uh, so anyway, that's one. And then, um, and then of course, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the wide laneways, the, the, when, as, I, as I said before, when there's not a lot of cars parked on the streets, it's just big asphalt space. Why? Why does it have to be that? Why can't it be? Uh, this is enough space. You have very broad streets. You, you, you're lucky that you do, uh, relative to other Atlantic Canada cities. And, and they have, uh, because it was laid out uh, early on in its settlement, and you have these broad 100-foot streets. And you can fit a lot in that 100 feet uh, that other cities can't. So Halifax doesn't have streets like that. And so you, you, would, uh, you, you could have on-street parking. You could have bike lanes. I mean, all the on-street parking and bike lanes doesn't have to actually be an asphalt. It doesn't have to look. It could, even, it could be asphalt, colored asphalt even. would make it look better. But let's, let's try to get, um, uh, and, and this is great. <laughs> I know, I know I, I'm pretty good. And I'm going to make an educated guess that a lot of trees were chopped down as these roads were widened. Because I'm feeling the trees, were, the positioning of the trees probably happened around the same place where these hydro poles would have been. So they would have been decimated. These would have been big, large, leafy streets at one time, I would imagine. 
And, uh, and I've seen this before where you have uh, an absolute extreme uh, maximization of the asphalt right to the, the God forbid we widen the sidewalk, but we'll widen that street. Um, and then, and then and, but for what purpose? Look at the width of that lane. You can see the yellow. That lane is, up, is, is uh, about twice the width that it needs to be on a street where you want slow moving traffic. Unnecessary. It, 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 it all it does is encourage f uh, traffic to move faster. Because as a, as a driver, and I'm a terrible driver because I do this, is I will, my speed will fit the space. Uh, so if I feel like I'm unlikely to collide into anything, I'm going to move through it a little less cautiously. I'll move at a faster speed. Unknowingly, I'll look down and see the, the, uh, the speedometer and go, oh shit, I better pull back that, pull that back. So um, luckily, you know, you don't have a lot of speed, speed you don't, I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of speeders that are, that are People are really polite here, and I, hopefully that will continue to be the case. Um, so this is just uh, Grafton, and just to show you uh, just what visually what you could do if you just cut down that asphalt, what it might be. Now you can imagine that, 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 that um, the, the brown area would, uh, would accommodate parking. You could then fit the sidewalk widened as with a bike lane, and I haven't even added the trees yet, but just to just visually uh, take that down, it would slow traffic down. You'd, than the public realm, and you begin to make this feel like a more uh, a more inviting environment to walk uh, if, if if you're going to be uh, trying to get people uh, on foot. So uh, I think I've got one more here. Right. So lastly, uh, this notion of a bi as a big idea, this notion of a you know net zero, self sufficient island or city, uh, and 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 uh, how you can. Um, I've just recently read up about this vertical agriculture stuff. It's spectacular. I mean, you can actually, this food directly gets delivered down to the first level, which is, would be a food store. So it's, it's uh, you, it, they're basically greenhouses that can grow food, and it, because it's local, it's uh, organic, and it's, and it's directly delivered. It's cheaper because it's not traveling over long distances and, and generating more CO2s. There's so many benefits to doing this. And it seems so appropriate and relevant and authentic in this place to evolve ag agriculture in, in a way that um, uh, would be uh, enriching to people's lives and to visitors. And that's the last slide. Sorry, that was very long. <laughs> Hopefully I kept your interest. Um, this is what happens when you do presentations uh, without having a chance to uh, uh, we recite them over and at least practice them. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Hi. What's your name? Want me to grab the mic? Oh, you want me to hand it to me? Yes. Yes. Good point. Okay, so let's do that. Hello? Hello? Okay, so. Because it's, it's, it's being streamed uh, on the internet, so we just want to, make, want to hear a question. I can also repeat it if you'd rather not. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, thanks for the presentation. Yeah. I'm Sathya Jitsen. I'm the policy advisor to the Federation of Municipalities. And, you know, the policy advisor to the Federation of Municipalities. Yeah. Uh, Based in Ottawa? No, here. Here? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we have a system of, we don't have a system of in PEI. Only 37% of land is incorporated, 63% of land is unincorporated, where you have very few regulations to build whatever you want. Oh. So it is causing urban sprawls. Now oh. the city and the town you're talking about, sir, it is more applicable in places where they have regulations and system of governance. Yeah. Unfortunately, in this province, we don't have that, yeah. right? And you can ask Mr. Tim Banks here, you know, the yeah. amount of, you know, you know, you won't be able to develop like skyscrapers in PEI. So what's your opinion on that? Okay, so, so that's a good question. Um, so uh, this is where uh, the province should play a role. Uh, you know, they, uh, if, if the province in, in Ontario can uh, create a regional plan, which has become, you know, a, a standard, a model that is, uh, uh, that is uh, um, uh, envied, first of all, in many cities around the world, because um, Province, uh, in its wisdom, uh, created a, a, a Toronto created an official plan, 
which was sustainable, talked about, you know, uh, about the ending sprawl, but it had already built out. It was really trying to give hints at the suburban areas to get their act together. But of course, it doesn't have jurisdiction over those areas. But the province uh, then followed up with, uh, with the, the growth plan. It's called the growth plan. They, they created a green belt. Added the, uh, they, they protected the moraine. They created these acts, the policies that protected uh, the hinterland uh, where all of the great the good soil, agricultural soil is, all of the natural uh, features that help to cleanse our water. Absolutely vital, vital environmental infrastructure to the city. And um, so the, 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 the uh, you know, those were not, uh, those were, even, those were organized areas under, under suburban, in suburban municipalities. They weren't even as bad as unorganized uh, or uh, where there was really no, uh, is there, is it the province? Is there an approving agency that's just kind of like a, a rubber stamping kind of thing at the province? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the, just to, to, to make sure that the question was heard, or the, the elaboration of the question, is that um, the, because these are unorganized areas, if, if, if the municipality uh, was to even try and bring in more um, onerous or restricted rules about the type of development that was better, uh, that was better suited for, for something that was more sustainable, it, it's difficult to, when you're in competition, so to speak, with the, the ex exterior of the periphery of the city, where there is no, no where, where it's basically a frontier. There's no, there's no rules, and why would you? The taxes are lower, and, uh, and, um, it, and it's, it, as we see this in New Brunswick. I, when I worked in New Brunswick and Fredericton, it's a problem. It's a problem in Moncton. So I, uh, I, I know that we had spoken to the province at the time about, about Get it, stepping in and being uh, providing the planning expertise because the province doesn't have the skill set, it doesn't have the uh, competency to be doing this, right? So they need to create a, an agency or a municipal agency or a department, right? No, they don't, right? So, they, so they don't, so they don't, they do, they know not what they do, right? They, <laughs> so, um, but but uh, they are probably unaware of just. Uh, of the, uh, the, the, how detrimental it would be to the future of this uh, province. So um, they just think of it as great, it's growth, it's development, this is good for our pro province, but it, it's not. It's, it's not any growth is good. It, it's only, uh, especially these days. But that's a good point. Yes. Yes. Tim Banks. Thank you. Um, do you mind if I sit? Um, I have a bit of experience. I ha I've been involved in uh, 21,000 apartment units uh, across Canada in purchasing, developing, building um, those. I'm very familiar with the Charlottetown Marketplace. And um, in your discussions here, you're, you showed a graph there about uh, basically a flight to the core meaning that in most major cities in Canada, my experience follows that, is that uh, people are moving to the downtown cores. Yeah. But over the last 10 years, what's happened in our community, in this city of Charlottetown, is for every new unit that's been built below Euston Street, every new unit, there's been 25 new units built above, above there. 
Yeah. And it's the only city, like, um, I, I work in every, I've built in every city, every town, every village in Atlanta, Canada. And Halifax, uh, we put a green roof in our new building there. And it's easy to put a new green roof in our building there because we went 22 stories. Yeah. Um, and it's easy to make the math work, the economics work, because we can go up, yep. make the units cheaper. But here we're limited to 39 foot, eight inches high on a building mm -hmm. on our bylaws. Yep. And uh, then we have people come and telling us that we should only go three stories high. And developers, this is the only city in Atlantic Canada, I don't have a competitor. Competitors come to Charlottetown and they read these bylaws and they exit. In downtown Truro, in downtown Truro, there's seven new apartment buildings being yeah. built yeah. under construction. And here, <laughs> there's none. And there's a reason for that. And it all has to do with economics. And I think what plays into this whole thing when we write new bylaws is we have to consider that we have to welcome developers to come in and reinvest because we're trying to across the street and I give you the math on if we build 84 units across the way, and each of those units on average cost, uh, cost $2,650 a month or a year for property tax for each of those units, that would mean the city of Charlottetown would get another $111,000 a year in taxes, which could be put into widening the streets in the downtown. It could be putting into sidewalks. But when people try to stop us from doing that, yeah. uh, how do you expect the politicians to have money to be able to do the things that you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. I do all these things. You talked about uh, Fogo Island. I'm building a new net zero hotel at Trackety Beach that will be every bit as yeah. you know, environmentally friendly as, as it will be there. I've just done 13 buildings here in PEI that are complete, all new solar, system, new solar panels on them, on every one of them. Mm -hmm. I have a, 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 I'm building the first net zero school in Atlantic Canada right yeah. now, yeah. like under, under design right now, yeah. and we're building it out in Sherwood. Yeah. But it's all economics. Yeah. And I think what's happening is you're comparing Halifax, Toronto, and Calgary you're, you're comparing them to our little village here. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful village. I live in King Street. I, I know, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful town. Mm -hmm. But in order to get parking lots like we have over there behind the polyclinic developed, it has to, there has to be math to it. Well, so are, are you getting, are you getting um, resistance on all of the developments that you've attempted to put here? On Richmond, over in, on Richmond Street, I applied to build a simple 23-unit, four-story building that's one inch below the bylaws because I had to get other variances. And from the time I submitted the permit, from the time I submitted the permit to when I was able to get a permit to actually build it because of two appeals to Iraq, and one to the Supreme Court, it took me four years and one month to get that permit. In the meantime, in the meantime, I went over to Stratford, and you can look across the way, I built a 78 unit on the water there, I built a 61 unit uh, up the street, I built a 45 unit in Montague, I built a 39 unit over in, uh, in, um, on Harley Street, built a 60 unit over in Acadia Drive, built them and put residents in them and people in them while I'm waiting to get that permit. Yeah. Because the, the, the yeah. 77 pages just open up appeals. They just, it just everybody in their backyard, that the condo neighbors next door, now you can go down to Richmond Street yourself personally. You have a look at the building we built. And one of the big resistances is I didn't have any parking spaces. 
and all the counselors, that was just like, they were going crazy. The city of Ottawa, you can get a permit for a new building downtown yeah. without, without. Yeah, most cities. Okay, yeah. so, so anyway, they made me, they made me rent 13 spaces in the parking garage. Yeah, at, they made me do that and sign signatory to it for 20 years. So I have to rent them? And we have 23 people living in that building now. And guess how many of them have taken up those parking spaces from me for, that I give for free? Yeah. Guess how many? Not the majority of them. Five. Yeah. Five. So, yeah. But, yeah. but the point is, is, Harold, I'm not here to fight with you. Yeah. I'm, I'm here to tell you that if you're going to come and talk to us, then call out the people that are doing it. We'll help. Like, yeah. I've made all the money I need to have for me. Yeah. I'm here to support my community. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm, I got better things to do today, but I'm here because I'm just trying to appeal yeah. to people to understand that there's more to it. It's easy to say green. And it, you know, let's put a green roof in the building. And that's what, it, that's what one of the benefits are. But I'll tell you from a carbon perspective, that a, the investment into a green roof is not as good as many other things you could do the building to lessen the carbon footprint. Yeah, I agree. There's, there's, okay, there's, yeah. many, many, many other things. Yeah. And I don't mind putting a green roof, but I'm sitting on 99 units down at Havland Street, and I can't even, <laughs> and I've, I got that development permit signed two and a half years ago, and I still haven't got a foundation permit. Well, that's, that, that's, that is indicative of a, 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 an issue, but that, that, and you know, the thing is, I'm, as you know, only aware of one development that's your, yours. I've not been privy to all the other ones. I'd be curious to take a look at them and see what, what the, because if it's, it's a pervasive and it's affecting all of the developers that are trying to develop in this well, area. It's the only place I don't have a competitor. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, there's, there's, uh, there's got to be a uh, correction. Anybody else have a question? That was a thank you, Tim, for, for giving us a completely different perspective on things. And, and a, from a real world one, too. Just a quick question. Can you speak about minimum parking requirements? Yeah. And why many cities are um, removing them? Yeah. So, um, so in, um, in an environment where you have choices, because you have like 500 lot area or downtowns and, and other places where you can actually walk more and most people do own, many people may own cars, but they don't use them every day. They, uh, like myself, I have a car, but I you know, use it to do grocery shopping. That's about it. Uh, but I don't use it to commute. I don't use it to visit friends. Um, I don't use it to go uh, uh, out at night. So um, the, the car, the, the, but typically in a household like mine, which would have two cars, one car isn't even barely being used. So uh, there is an acceptance of, of the fact that less people own cars, and, and Tim uh, uh, verified this in his own experience, that even in Charlottetown, car-oriented Charlottetown, with parking spaces given for free to the tenants, only five out of how many? Out of 23, took him up on that. So that's probably indicative, and I don't know whether the last time the city has done a parking study, but there's a demand that's generated, and then there's people who choose to live here because they can't afford a car, don't want a car, don't, you know, there's a whole new millennials that don't want a car. Then, uh, so if you think about all of the spaces, and, 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 and sometimes, mostly on-site, in some cases like Tim had to do, he had to get off-site parking, all of the spaces generated not on the street, for each of the units and, par and all of the commercial spaces, each of them generating different parking ratios, in addition to on-street parking, which is continuous on all the streets here, there's an abundance of parking. There's, there's far more parking than you could ever need. And, um, but the parking is never exactly where the parker wants it because they want it right in front of the store, right in front of the destination, right in front of their house. And that's the problem. They, there's an expectation that we've set up that is, creating an entitlement, uh, you know, a city of entitlement around parking. And so parking, it's a cultural thing that you have to wean people off. It's an, it looks like an addiction. So um, eventually people realize that um, 
to have a better place and a better city, you sometimes have to walk a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit. So the point, uh, the, with the question, just to get back to the question, uh, the, 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 there's a shift, I talked about the shift in culture, there's a shift in generation in terms of parking requirements and needs, there's an affordability. The biggest expense in many, many, many people's affordability issues is cars, I mean, as well. I mean, is, uh, uh, if you're having an affordability issue in your, in your, in your driving, uh, you don't really have an affordability issue, in my opinion. I mean, I, I couldn't afford a car for many, many years. And I think that, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, that there's, a, there's a question about, uh, about, uh, about need and demand, and one needs to kind of attest, uh, get to the truth of the matter. So where cities are eliminating minimums, it's to do two things. One is to acknowledge the fact that they don't actually have a parking problem. They have a parking perception problem. Number two, they, uh, they want to create a disincentive for drivers. There's people who need to drive, and there's people who just drive because they can, and it's easy to. So um, when, uh, when they, uh, to, to eliminate congestion in big cities, you actually usually only need to get rid of 5% of drivers. Otherwise, everything's functioning quite efficiently. It's a lot of people who don't need to be driving on the streets. When you create disincentives, it's only about getting just a slim number of people off the streets to, 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 uh, to, to actually eliminate the, 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 the parking and the congestion issues. It's not a huge radical change. It's just a small percentage that usually is a tipping point. So um, the, min the minimums have, uh, when, when minimums began to get dropped, uh, particularly in mixed use zones, in, there was another aha moment. Well, the parking demands in a mixed use area happened staggered. When you live there and you have a car uh, and you don't maybe necessarily live downtown, you're taking your car out and creating a parking space for, guess what, somebody who's coming in. So the one car parking spot actually is duplicating and triplicating and, and sometimes in trip being used tr by triple different stages of the day by three different people. So there's the office worker coming in at nine, from nine to five or eight thirty to, but that space is being, um, uh, is, is being uh, relieved just as the person who is living there, maybe downtown and works elsewhere, is, uh, is, is uh, releasing that space. So there's a, stag there's a staggering of parking spaces and you guess it's impossible to count. You have to just have faith in eliminating the minimums and when you really do have a parking problem, you'll know because the, the, the numbers will tell you. The, the, the uh, people driving around looking for parking spots is the telling, is the telling that you might have a par parking problem. Um, and, and there's an adjustment period you have to give yourself because people will, will adjust their behavior. So um, the first time, as Tim pointed out, there are cities now who eliminate parking requirements altogether uh, for residences. And, and it's accepting that there's been a change. Uh, there hasn't been, uh, most people think about it. Would you go and buy a place or rent a place if you own a car and not have a place to, to park it? No, you, if you have a car you're bringing along with you, you're gonna, you want to make sure that the apartment you're renting or the house that you're buying has a parking spot because you're going to put your car somewhere. So um, it's, it's, uh, it, it goes against the, the, the uh, rational thinking because people think that people, uh, if you don't create parking, you're going to create infiltration issues, that people are going to find the cars and park them somewhere else. In an environment like this where parking is so abundant, maybe, uh, but I don't think it's... Um, uh, but any, anyhow, so the minimum, the minimum requirements, it's absolutely, in a, it shouldn't be across the board, across Charlottetown. It needs to be done in baby steps. It needs to start with the mixed use areas where there's an abundance of parking, on street parking, and staggered users. So there's a mix of uses here. So the same parking spot will actually be utilized by two different people at minimum. So, um, but uh, absolutely, there's, there's no, um, affordable housing units shouldn't require any parking at all, in my opinion. And then, uh, and then, uh, uh, usually uh, in, in urban areas between 0.25 parking spots per unit is, is probably about appropriate. Here it's one unit, per par one parking space per unit. It's very, very high. So I know I just want to be conscious of the fact that we've gone over time. People need to leave, you can leave. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, I'm happy to. Okay, uh, yeah. just, just the official wrap up and then perhaps Harold can yeah. hang a road at the back if there's any other burning questions that you'd like to ask. So first of all, uh, I just ask everyone to just thank you so very much yeah. for um, helping us all take a new look at our city and rethinking our space.
I'm sure everyone has taken home their own particular little nugget that they're thinking about. I saw an awful lot of busy pencils and phones going. Mm -hmm. Everything's special to, to different people. I've got notes about complexity and good collisions. I'm a fan now of the mayor of Bogota. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at, we used to have ferries. Uh, we actually, they were dismantled all not, not that long ago. Reconsideration of who owns the streets, road diets, um, and redirecting rainwater, and that's very critical in an island that's surrounded by salt water with people's well, uh, wells now starting to get salinated and having to move their pressure water wells. So you touched on an awful lot of stuff. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for bringing the ideas, oops, bringing the ideas right into our community and our island. And uh, just for those, uh, the this has been recorded on St. Paul's uh, YouTube channel, so it is archivable and retrievable. Anyone who's here with a ticket, I have your email address through the Eventbrite site. If you just came in out of interest, I'll have a piece of paper at the back in a minute or two, and you can leave your email there, and then I can send you the link directly, and I'll probably also load it up on the Eventbrite site as well, uh, just for increased access. So if we could all just take a moment and say thank you very much, Mr. Matty. Thank you. And I'm providing the presentation as well to, for you as a link, so you can oh, people can download awesome. it. Awesome! So just the presentation yeah. as well, without the uh, uh, dialogue on it. Oh. Awesome! That's extremely generous. I will organize this all. I still have to send her the link. I sent her the. Doc. I was just like this was fresh like off fresh the press, out of the so box. Yeah, fresh out of the press. Yeah. It's, it's so she's just not, there. So she's not seen it yet. Yeah. No, no. So this is awesome. So thank you yeah. very much, and thank you very much, Mr. Matty, again. Yeah, welcome. And St. Paul's. <laughs> I actually have a plane to catch. You do? I changed my flight, yeah. I, uh, I, uh,